Kay, and and Annette is from uh, uh, from Ireland, and I think I'm not sure. Michelle, are you uh, um, able to unmute? If you aren't, that's fine. But um, it, it I, I just say if you put your um, email in the chat then we can send you the text. I think these, these fairy tales in, um, in what's called the feminine in fairy tales, they are in a series that, that each one builds, thank you, Michelle, each one uh, builds on itself to describe the problem of feminine uh, psychology and the problems in feminine psychology. And, uh, to it now, now I want to say one thing, and I, I've said this before, is the feminine energy is in both men and women equally, and so as well as masculine energy is. But the difference is that um, that the ego consciousness is more familiar with only usually one side of it and so it's less conscious of the other side but where does those energies come from they don't come from outside of you you know they come from inside of you so so your life task is to become more conscious of that as side of yourself that is unknown to you or is less familiar to you you know and um so in, in the case, and, and, and we live in an age where not, I'm not talking about uh, the literal, literal uh, aspect of, of women. I'm talking about we're living in an age where feminine energy is not valued. Uh, it, it's just, it, it, and, and what I'm saying, the reason is that there's only one reason is because the thinking function and the function of the extroversion is overvalued. I mean, it's more valuable to have a high IQ than it is to be someone who is a, a genius at the feeling function or a genius at the sensate function or a genius at, with the intuitive function. You're, that's not valued in uh, uh, it is in in uh, the way um, this current age is shaped. Now, is that a bad thing? Well, I think what has happened is the pendulum has swung really far in one way for a purpose. Because the farther it goes this way, and the farther it is from where it started, there is a greater tension that develops between the two poles. So now there is a greater possibility of consciousness if the pendulum swings way, way, way too far in one direction. You know, but now it has to swing back. But anyway, um, the, uh, um, the, the men, well, well, first of all, Marion Woodman, her, her, she said she spent her whole life uh, trying to find out what it meant to live consciously feminine because she said she was infected as much by anyone uh, with thinking and with uh, the rational materialism of the current age. But anyway, what we're gonna do uh, uh, today is just finish this, the handless maiden. And you know, the story of, of the handless maiden is that uh, real quickly, just to review it, um, is uh, uh, that um, there was a man who, uh, now, now I think that I like this story a little better than the one von Franz tells. There was a miller who, who ground his mill uh, by muscle power. And, uh, and while he's doing it, this, uh, this man says, why don't you use the magic of the water wheel? You know, I'll teach you that magic if you will just give me uh, what lies behind your uh, mill. And uh, he was thinking it was his apple tree, his great apple tree. And he said, oh, well, that's fine. I will give up a little of my nature, that my connection with, in, with nature to get your water wheel. But what he was really giving up was not the, not the, uh, the apple, 
adultery, but his soul, and his soul was represented by uh, by the woman or by his daughter, and she um, she to uh, protect her hands from this devilish aspect of uh, um, of consciousness. You know, really, uh, the the devil represents more than anything uh, a um, separation from nature if you really want to know what what the devil is it is a, a an organizing center of consciousness with no connection to the source no connection to nature that's what makes it devilish you know and it's really it's, uh, uh you know edinger calls it the um it's the ego archetype it's the it's the archetype of the self-willed ego which has no connection whatsoever with where it came from. And uh, so this whole uh, uh, fairy tale is, is really, she, she, the reason she has uh, 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 no hands is she protects her hands from, uh, from her feeling hands from the devil by uh, weeping on them and covering them with tears. And then, then the devil makes her father cut him off her, her uh, a man, an animus she meets later, gives her silver hands, and uh, which are not really as good as the living hands. But anyway, we're going to finish. Hi, Azim. Nice to see you. We're just getting started here. And, uh, Hi, everybody. So, yeah. So uh, what, what we're going uh, to, the, the, the really, the, I'm, I'm saying that the fairy tale, I'm just my own interpretation, is uh, split into two parts. One part is that the woman here cannot connect with her positive animus until she herself becomes a living being connected with her own primeval forest or nature within herself. She can't do it um, as a Someone who's been shaped by the collective principles of uh, uh, of uh, the outer world, and um, now, and now, you know, Gerhard Dorn, uh, Young, Young likes to quote him, but one of the things he said that it's no more important to know what we are rather than who we are. And I was just thinking about that this morning. What what does it mean to have a a body, you know, and to be a living creature, you know, and to live trapped in a barn, let's say, for your entire life, and to finally live as the creature that you were meant to be, you know, this is, uh, uh, what, what does it mean to actually uh, the, the place that she goes to, her refuge, is called Here May People Live Freely. That's what it says ab above the uh, little hut that she's in. And uh, what, what, freely from what? You know, what does that mean to live freely? Um, you know, uh, it's, it's you, you, what you're living free from is, is a, uh, this connection uh, uh, from the collective realm that has has separated you from nature, and and by the way, um, uh, I, I'm let's see, I'm not sure. Uh, is it Aline? Uh, yeah, hi Aline. Uh, if you uh, um, would like to get the text of the books we we're reading, you know, we've read several. Um, just put your um, email in the chat and. Uh, we're doing the best part, I think, here of the handless maiden. But anyway, uh, we're, let's we're going to. And the other other aspect of that this is 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 the second aspect of this fairy tale is once you have be, be, um, through through introversion and through uh, being conscious of your own lo loneliness and not not uh, being related uh, uh, to. Uh, the world and to nature with silver hands, but with living hands. After you have found that out, 
Now you are ready to um, unite with the archetype of meaning, the positive animus, but not before. You know, now that's the balance it, it, that you have. Um, the, that feminine aspect of the woman needs to be primary. And then the, um, the, the archetype of meaning, the masculine aspect needs to be, she needs to be in service to it and it needs to be in service to her, but it, it can't be her master. So uh, that the second, and, and isn't it beautiful at the end, the, um, this, this positive animus veils his eyes because they're too piercing. He needs to veil his eyes and, and because he sees in, uh, in twilight, you know, uh, and uh, this is this famous uh, saying of uh, James Joyce and Ulysses, shut your eyes and see. Now, the, the idea is that the too harsh vision is uh, killing of, of the uh, uh, relationship to, uh, to this realm of images in the body. Now, you, you know, the one thing I'm, I'm this is just a revelation myself, is that the real wisdom of, of the depths, whatever you want to call it, is the wisdom that shaped your body, the one that gave you lungs and a heart and two eyes and a nose, which we all take for granted. Oh, oh you know, uh, that, that's, that's a given. Well, where did they come from? You know, I mean, it's a little bit mysterious. Well, anyway, uh, so so let's just go over the first part. Now, the first part is um, uh, that uh, this woman who has an unredeemed de demonic side, uh, you know, this relationship with the devil, uh, is she she it cannot um, that she has a a disconnection from spontaneity, her, her what she should be doing spontaneously is brought about only by force of will. So there's insufficient spontaneity symbolized by her silver hands. Now this is the being what, uh, what um, Robert Johnson calls silver handedness. It is just not, um, you're cut off from acting uh, like those cows do when they come out of the barn after all winter. The instinct is replaced by the rule of the collective. And she says these people, have uh, know that they have a dead corner in them. There is something unredeemed, and they are restless. So their seeking remains, and they need to go into the forest. And that that's where she goes, um, and they're protected by an angel from the devil. So this is very interesting that she uh, both meets the devil and the angel. That's the her, and von Franz is going to have something to say about this that this is very typical of, of, of feminine fairy tales, is that when you go into the unconscious, you meet the devil and, and the God immediately, both of them. Now, she's driven into nature where she has to find the connection with her positive animus within. And uh, uh, instead of just functioning according to the collective rules, she has to go into deep introversion. She goes into virgin country. Now, this is something Marion Woodman says. We don't know what the word virgin means. It means um, that a uh, place that um, has uh, not been contaminated by collective rules. So anything that is virgin is, is uncontaminated by, um, by ego consciousness. You know, it is as it always was. It's untouched. And so she retires into the forest so that um, she, you know, Von Franz says that the idea is um, that uh, the woman who is very close to related uh, is, is a related being, um, you know, marries without a real deep, true relationship. Sometimes she has children without uh, being related to them. Uh, in, in a deep, spontaneous way. And uh, uh, so uh, then she finds at some stage in her life 
that she's lonely. And uh, because this, these, these, having these sort of artificial silver handed relationships in her life uh, were not really, um, uh, she was not acting spontaneously. She lived this life with silver hands, you know. So um, now what she's trying to do is to uh, recover her living hands. But, um, so she, she retires into, uh, uh, she, not only from all animus opinion and views of life, but from any kind of impulse to do what seems to be demanded of her. And uh, so this, this is the, the primeval force. Okay. So she needs to get in touch with, with this primeval force, this primeval nature. She needs to be in sync with that and to get her living hands back, you know, uh, but just to, uh, she needs to learn how to act spontaneously. That's the purpose of, of being in connection with this uh, silver, uh, this, um, uh, now the living in the forest would be, um, means sinking into one's innermost nature and finding out what it feels like to be in one's innermost nature. And vegetation of the forest symbolizes spontaneous life and offers healing to those who've been destroyed by uh, a, either a negative father or a negative mother. Complex. And uh, so, um, now, in, in both cases uh, of either the father or the mother, and the, uh, it, she says uh, the mother, the, the, the negative mother and the demonic father, they're the same development in a, in, in a woman or really a man. And in both cases, the woman is doomed to passivity and must return and go back to the unheard virgin ground in her soul. Now she says, uh, in practical life, you can ask such a woman, a woman who is suffering from this, uh, what she could, would do if she could rid herself of the demands of outer life. What, what would you do if you didn't have any demands of outer life? What would you do? And she, usually, this is von Franz, says she despairingly, she doesn't know all she can think of is that she would sit on the edge of her bed crying. And uh, so you can ask her if she would not like to talk to somebody, to listen to music, to contact friends, and she, but there's nothing. So this is reaching the zero point, which is absolutely necessary. That you regress into this primitive layer because this is uh, in alchemy is called the negredo. You know, it's the, it's the, it's the lowest level. Once you hit bottom, then you can reconnect again. But you're really, you are, you really are where Inanna is when she opens up the seventh gate and goes through it, because she's given up every single aspect of her upper life. And now she's at this uh, level where she's given it all up. So the forest is the place where things begin to turn green and grow around, grow again. And so it's this healing uh, regression. That's what she needs. Now, uh, this, how, what do we, how do we uh, translate this into real life is uh, the question. Now, the girl was forced to go into the forest. There she met the angel, reached the zero point. And uh, uh, the fairy tales said that to her and to us that we must go completely into nature. Now, you can't do this, she says, by choice, usually. You need divine intervention. Okay. That's what the angel means. She, so practically, uh, what you need is a religious experience, a personal religious experience, is the only thing that can help this poor girl out of her difficulty. A miracle. Okay, let's just put it that way. A synchronistic miracle. One that, uh, you know, completely, uh, um, you know, this is, uh, this is, this was a mantra uh, that I used to do when I meditate in Zen. 
um, grade uh, uh, the uh, um, this is from the Gospel of Thomas. You know, uh, the Gospels ask Jesus, when will the kingdom of the Father come? And he says, the kingdom of the Father will not come by expectation, waiting for it. Men will not say, see here, see there. The kingdom of the Father is spread upon the earth right now, but men do not see it. It is here, it is here. Atvam asi, thou art that. Omani padmi um, the jewel, the mystery we see is in uh, the lotus, the world we live in. So, I mean, this is that aspect of looking at things differently. And it really does require a change in consciousness, which we call a miracle, you know. But it's somewhat of a, 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 a some type of thing happens to us and we are never the same again. It's either a dream or an experience, or in the case of, of the woman uh, it, and what she's going to say, it is through, uh, she matures through tremendous, and, and this is not just the woman, but anyone, through tremendous suffering. And, and you know, uh, her, her child is named Sorrowful, okay? And, and the etymology of the word Sorrowful comes from also from the word sore, which means a wound. So her child is named the wound. And what is the wound? The wound is that she is disconnected from, uh, from the mother, from the great mother, from nature. You know, how do, we, and, and that's the wound we all suffer, you know. So in this supreme moment of loneliness and sadness, now, activity in the unconscious can begin. And at that moment, her hands are healed. Um, her hands are healed by the supreme moment of loneliness and sadness. Now, now this, is, this is the idea of uh, uh, in, in AA, you, know, you can't cure yourself of the enchantment in, in Alcoholics Anonymous. No one can do it until they hit bottom, till they absolutely have nothing left, no hope, nothing can save them. At that point, they're ready to be saved, not before. And uh, it's so in this supreme moment of loneliness and sadness, we, this is the moment of, of in going through the seventh gate, the Kanana, and where we have given up everything that we have above. You know, we've given up all of this. And now in that moment, you get living hands. Her hands grew again as before. You know, and it always refers to healing by nature and not by a willful act. And in uh, some versions, we, we went through this, but they, it's, it's healed by putting your arms around the tree. She doesn't have any hands. Okay. But she puts her arms around the tree hands grow and then connect on the other side. And the idea is uh, this, um, uh, they are healed by a process of inner growth. And uh, uh, now they're um, in the quest of the hero, it's responsible action that brings about the process of, of individuation rather than tremendous suffering. And she says, and this is something I just highlighted, is the, the heroic deed and tremendous suffering are aspects of the same process. Okay. Uh, they, are, they are the same process, but they're uh, two different roads. Now, um, sometimes also without anything being done, she says, uh, things just change by brooding. This will come up later, incubating. That's what she's doing in the forest, being in there so long. She's incubating and brooding. And uh, uh, it needs to be done for us. She was there for many years. Um, there are just some situations that where one has to wait and through non-interference, non-interference is the healing factor. Now, in the uh, Russian version, uh, the one thing I wanted to add to that is, uh, uh, which is, you know, the more most powerful version. And if you haven't heard it, is uh, 
is where um, she has no hands. She has her child sorrowful with her. She leans in to get a drink of water. The child falls into the water. Okay. And uh, then this, uh, this um, old, wise old man yells, take the child out. She says, I have no hands. He says, take the child out. Now, she reaches into the waters of life. She reaches into the unconscious. To rescue the growing thing within her. And obtains living hands. So that's what's really happening. She's through through reaching in to the waters of life, through reaching into the unconscious to rescue and redeem. Now, this is al alchemy. This is what happens in alchemy. The, the idea in alchemy is that you are not redeemed. The ego consciousness is not redeemed. You redeem the growing thing within you that is a drop is dropped into the waters of life. At that point, she gets living hands and she can uh, pull the baby out. And uh, uh, so um, that is uh, something that she gives some examples that she's seen that in her own uh, practice uh, that um, if a, a, a person cannot, will do nothing to save themselves. They will do nothing themselves but if there is some growing aspect within them say a real child or that uh something that has taken place for the child within them if that one is in peril they will do anything to rescue it and through rescuing that growing thing within them they rescue themselves now this is really the meaning of compassion you know it means the mystery of service and of the mystery of the i vow it, compassion means suffering with, you know, and and Jung used to say uh, that uh, people who would come to him with absolutely unhealable wounds say that their their child died or something like that, something that will never heal, that is a wound that will last forever, and and so he says the only way that such a person can heal themselves is being in service to those who have suffered a similar wound. At that point, you regain your living hands, you know, and, uh, uh, but in, in this case, um, it, it, I really like that image of, that she reaches into the waters of life and to rescue the growing thing and, and regains her living hands. So, um, uh, but she says, even in uh, the, the, the Russian story, the woman cannot save the child herself, she loves so much from drowning. God himself has to come and say, do try. Do try. I mean, you know, there's this aspect of the divine intervention. Well, well you, you know, let's just talk about what is divine? You know, what is divinity? You know, I mean, what it really is, is, um, is uh, <laughs> how do you see with your eyes? Is that an accident of uh, a mathematical accident of the current? Look at the colors that we see. Is, is there a divine aspect of that? Where did music come from? Where did Mozart come from? Is that an accident, a mathematical, uh, just, you know, the dice rolled one way that day, you know, and Mozart wrote, uh, that uh, that that piece, it's divine. It's it is what what they call um, in uh, you know in physics entropy is where all things uh, go back to uh, a a steady state. You know if if something's too hot, it be it it loses uh, temperature. If it's too cold, it warms itself until it gets to a steady state. But, but what they call uh, seeing with your eyes and all of these wonderful magical things that happen to us is neg entropy, you know, which means a state of improbable order. So what's the divine? It's the state of improbable order. There's an order, uh, 
in chaos, but it's it is not uh, just purely uh, by chance. There is something else is the organizing aspect here. So uh, what divine intervention is, you know, uh, is uh, um, now now he uh, talks about that um, that often Young says that um, that women who tend to either have a negative or negative father complex often miss the first half of life. And this is something I experienced myself. Which I really did miss the first half of life. Wished I could go back and start do it, live it again. They walk past the first half of life as if they're in a dream, you know. And and life to them was just this, uh, you know, constant, uh, uh, just sources of annoyances and irritations and disappointments and and uh, and uh, grief, you know. But if they can overcome the negative mother complex, he says they have a good chance in the second half of life of rediscovering life. But now they regain the youthful spontaneity they missed in the first half. Uh, but, and he says this, and she quotes it several times, though a part of life has been lost, its meaning has been saved. Okay. This is the living hands. So a part of life has lost, its meaning has been saved. And, you know, I, I asked one time, the great mother, I just had this, uh, or, you know, this person in active agitation, whoever it is, you know, um, that I wished I could go back and, and knowing what I know now to start life over again. And she says, well, I'm not going there with you. I'm staying here. She says, you can go back there if you want, but I'm sitting here. And by the way, why don't you just do the things that you would have done back then if you start over right now? She says, do it now. And she says, it's never too late to become what you could have been. You know, and, and it's this um, uh, one, one who uh, lives. Now, now there's a, a, this wonderful uh, uh, saying of uh, Nietzsche you know, that a, a wheel that turns of itself, you know, uh, it, the wheel that rolls of itself. This is the child within us, you know, this wheel that rolls of itself. And uh, now um, the, the only reason they mention, uh, you know, Hillman uh, is a, a kind of against child, uh, uh, you know, uh, making the child, uh, glorifying the child. But the idea of the child is its spontaneity, I think is what it really means. It doing things without uh, thinking about it. So the tragedy of such women is they uh, get, uh, if they can get to the turning point in the second half of life, uh, heal their hands and can stretch out for what they really love. And this, what they really love does not come from the animus or from the ego, but now according to their own nature, simply stretch out their hands to something they really love. This woman that she, she says, what would you do if all your demands were missed? And she says, I don't know. I think I would just sit on the edge of the bed crying. But if you can find out what it is that you follow your bliss, find out what it is that you really love, stretch out your hands to it, you will regain your living hands. And, though, and she says, though it seems so infinitely simple, it is extremely difficult for it is the one thing that a woman who has a negative mother complex or a demonic father cannot do. And uh, I would say also a power eternus cannot do. They know what to do consciously, but they uh, can't act. They won't. They just can't act. They still need God's help. They need the unconscious. Uh, even, and, and the analysts can't help you either. They can help. Uh, they can um, maybe get you a right attitude, but uh, they um, they can't get you to uh, see what is so simple. And she says that people who do act spontaneously um, uh, can't figure out why it's so hard for other people, you know. Uh, but it is is it is though it's very simple. And and she says um, that. Uh, um, 
the ones who have found it, it's it's really is a religious message to find out this uh, way of acting is spontaneously and now to live that way is like a zen experience it's like satori if you can act spontaneously this is what daisat suzuki said about satori it's uh, what's satori like they ask him he says oh it's just like regular life there's no difference except now you're four inches off the floor your feet and or it's you know that that first i i just saw m- m- I thought rivers were rivers and mountains were mountains. Found out they weren't rivers, weren't rivers, rivers weren't mountains. When he achieves Satori, then he knows that rivers are rivers and rivers are mountains. But now he has living hands and he's living spontaneously. You know? And uh, so now this is what she needs before she can contact the positive animus or unite with the positive animus. Now we're gonna talk about the positive animus uh, here quickly and uh let's see somebody move my clock oh we got plenty of time i think okay um now uh, the the king has come to look for his wife okay so so we're assuming now that she's got living hands okay that's that's the and how did she get them she uh, i think the best example of it is that she she reaches into the waters of life and rescues her, her, the growing thing within her from it, pulls it out into consciousness, okay? She pulls the growing thing within her out of, uh, to, it, that's, that's in the waters of life, pulls it out of the waters of life and presses it to her breast. Okay, she's pulled it into consciousness and that's how her living hands grew again, you know? Now, Again, it is sort of a Zen experience to have this achieved. It's not as easy as it sounds. Okay, but once you've achieved that, now you're re- ready to unite with the positive animus. But there's a trick in the positive animus here. The king goes to look for his wife, but he doesn't recognize her. So he put, uh, so he lies down to sleep and puts a, a cloth over his face. And his wife, having been told by the angel that her husband is there, tells her boy, sorrowful, the wound, um, to uh, pick up the napkin which had fallen off her father's face and recover his face. The king hears his wife talking to the boy and recognizes her, and the couple is reunited. Now, uh, this, um, the, the, uh, uh, it, we're, we're going to talk about the aspect of the um, of the uh, uh, covering the face. Um, what what does that mean? Uh, sorrowful is the fruit of the woman's life. He possessed. Uh, uh, it, 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 she's passed through the whole experience of suffering, and acquired secretly that wisdom that comes through suffering. And by knowing so much about suffering, she can now adapt to life. Uh, and having gone through a great deal in a mature way, she's naturally able to help herself and others. And uh, uh, the, so um, the motif is the king's face has to be covered in order to protect him from the sun shine is very meaningful. And I wanna show you, this is a, a little picture of a painting that uh, uh, Young always uh, really uh, liked. And I just want to uh, tell you what, uh, show you what he said about it. This is um, right here. Now, now this is a painting of Goethe uh, by uh, 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 Styler. You know, this, is, this is his hero, Goethe. And by the way, he thought that Goethe was the most complete man who had ever lived. And by the way, he's Goethe's great grandson. Uh, is the uh, that his his great grandmother uh, had her his grandfather out of wedlock, and Goethe was the father. That's the family uh, legend, and it's there's actually some evidence of this. 
but um, he, he'd start talking about the uh, colors of the, of the functions. And he says, thinking is white or blue, cold like snow. Intuition is gold or yellow because it is felt to shine and radiate. You can see this in intuitive person's eyes as in the picture of Goethe by Styler, for instance. Such eyes do not just look at things, they gleam towards them. They see no detail, but rather a sort of magic atmosphere that surrounds things, an inner perception rather than an outer. But if you're going to look down through a microscope, it is useless to gleam in its direction. You need sensation eyes for that, pin set eyes, which will pick out every detail. Okay, those are the eyes of too much clarity. For these eyes, these are the eyes that don't look at things, they gleam at them to find the magic and atmosphere that surrounds them. Just Okay. Um, any so so uh, the the idea here is that his that that cloth that covers his eyes is um, uh, the uh, is uh, is a deference of the too clear attitude of the animus eyes need to be to unite with the feminine need not to be so glaring so desiccating, so drying, like the, the demon sun at midday. So there needs to be this aspect of the, the, uh, the um, desiccating eyes. And she, she mentions too, that the hero has to go far away from the earth. You know, Icarus, I mean, Azine, you were telling about uh, where Icarus, this is beautiful, that it's painting Icarus, uh, you know, flies too close to the desiccating sun, his, the wax that holds his wings together melts and he falls and he falls into the sea and everyone sitting around sees a little splash and uh, nobody pays any attention. <laughs> now this, this is sort of the, uh, uh, this is the state really of, uh, of uh, Philemon and Bacchus, okay? You know, uh, where, um, where is it Hermes and Zeus come to visit Philemon and Bacchus? And they are the only two that uh, all, everyone else in, in the countryside refused the gods' hospitality. Uh, yet Philemon and Bacchus uh, did. And, uh, you know, so they were, uh, they, they were, and, and the reason they did is because they were going to kill, uh, they didn't have anything for the, the gods to eat. They only had one goose when it, that was a goose that was supposed to be their egg layer. So they're gonna kill the goose and feed it to uh, Hermes and Zeus. And the goose knew that these two were the gods. Philemon and Bacchus didn't know this. So it knew they were the gods, so it runs to the gods for protection. And uh, at that point, uh, the uh, that's when they learn that it's Zeus and Hermes, you know. Uh, but that's that's kind of the situation of the Icarus falling into the uh, plop into the ocean, and no one pays any attention. That's the state we're in, and that's why Young uh, called uh, his uh, uh, dedicated um, dedicated Bolingen to Philemon because he wanted to. Uh, uh, he wanted to create a, a place that was showed hospitality to to the mythic images, to the living energy of the depths, and it is a lie, you know. It really is. I mean, you know, I I say in my active imagination, you know, this guy. I'm talking about myself. I don't like this guy. He he just comes in here with so much. You know, he's thinking this is all doubt. You know, he's doubting it. He's 
you know, he's the full of, of and and uh, this this voice says says, who does he think he is? Who who created his body? Who created his eyes and his ear? Did his ego create that? Did his what he's so proud of in his conscious life create that? No, he didn't. And you know, this is this is uh, that uh, what Young's talking about that wisdom that created it and yet speaks to us so beautifully in stories and myths of any million kinds every night you get five or six little uh, gems given to you you know every night and this is uh, so anyway the idea is that um, the, that the animus that she needs to connect with um, uh, she cannot uh, she says now here's if you take the king as a man, it would mean this. He cannot reconnect with his anima uh, uh, without first putting a cloth over his face. Okay. <laughs> well, this is uh, what we do when we go into, into active imagination. You want to reconnect with the anima, you have to put a cloth over your, your face. So um, uh, it, it's keeping himself away from the principles of of thinking, collective consciousness, only by shutting his eyes to the outside world can he unite with the suffering of his anima, the inner world, the body, and nature itself. And, you know, this has uh, always been uh, sort of my, uh, one of my uh, little mantras. This is from Ulysses, you know, shut your eyes and see. So the idea is, that's the idea of uh, that um, the only way you can see is to, uh, to use that vision of Goethe, to not look at things to, with inset eyes, you know, with, you know, these, these detail eyes, you need to gleam towards things and see the magic atmosphere that surrounds it. And that's the idea of the, of the napkin being put on. Um, now she is, uh, 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 let's see, um, I, I don't know uh, if we uh, can just sum it up a little bit here. Uh, the, um, uh, the, in, this, in this meeting then, they are united in both feeling and attitude. Uh, this is the union of opposites. The woman with the, with the, with the uh, living hands now and the animus that it has the wisdom to know that it must, the only way it can unite with uh, uh, the nature, with living hands, is the way that the king, uh, that, that the man unites with his anima by putting a cloth over his, his inset eyes, using the, the vision of Goethe, using the vision of intuition and not sensate thinking eyes. You know, the, um, uh, the end, I guess, is uh, she does have a, a little bit of a, a postscript. She just says the heroine must live isolated in nature to heal. The handless maiden for many years must uh, drift far away from outer life. She was cured only by accepting the fact that she had to stay quiet in the woods, in her own woods, in her own little forest and to uh, temporarily not get back into life until she could act spontaneously, until she had living hands. So, uh, and she says, this is a frequent motif in fairy tales of being excluded for life for many years, illustrates the problem of feminine psychology. She says, from outside, it looks like stagnation, but in reality, it is a time of initiation and incubation. When a deep inner spit, split is cured and inner problems are solved, it uh, forms a contrast to the more active quest of the male hero who has to go into the beyond, has to go far away from the body to slay the monster, find the treasure, or uh, find the bride. He has to make a journey and accomplish some deed instead of his in of incubating and and initiation. Uh, but, um, it, it, you know, the idea of the alchemical vessel is incubated. You know, 
what is the heat that's applied to the alchemical vessel that makes uh, it magical? It is ego attention. It is incubating. It is uh, active imagination. This brooding, brooding uh, something and, and letting it come because um, the idea of, uh, of the creator, you know, uh, Brahman, you know, uh, was this, is Brahman that sits there in deep meditation, incubated, brooding. Suddenly, an animal appears before everybody. Brahman is as surprised and horrified by this manifestation as everyone else in the room is. He doesn't know where it came from either. You know, uh, uh, that that's um, this one saying: "Don't ask from where the uh, flowers come. The God of Spring Himself does not know the answer." So this idea of for whatever it is that's never before been seen on land or sea to come into being happens through brooding and incubation. It doesn't come through a heroic act or deed. You know, it, it comes through. Uh, and this is the, this is the uh, aspect of, of creation. It's not uh, a, a, a great journey or a great uh, uh, deed. You know, it's it's this typical difference between the masculine and feminine principles. Uh, the uh, it's it's uh, the unconscious is experienced its isolation by the heroine, and afterwards comes comes the return into life. So it's this uh, aspect of of that she needs some time alone, you know, to brood and to incubate, you know, to uh, where. She doesn't need to, uh, now, now there's nothing wrong with it. Now, now, we're not talking about literal women here. Make sure you keep this in mind because this used to infuriate Marion Woodman that whenever she would talk about the feminine principle, she, you, you know, one thing Edinger said one time, he would never mention any ism because if he did, a, uh, he, would, she, he would automatically release a poison into the room. What we're talking about are mythic images here, but um, the the idea of uh, of brooding and incubating is important for both men and women, you know, and and this initiation into the depths. So the handless maiden c confronts. Uh, now here's just one little uh, finish here. The handless maiden confronts a deep religious problem, comes under the influence immediately of the angel and the devil. And uh, uh, she says, in primitive material, the heroine, whenever she goes into the unconscious, is always confronted with the good and evil as immediately after she enters the unconscious. She becomes uh, known to both sides. She must encounter both sides, the dark side and the light side. And she, she, he says, she says, in masculine psychology, the, it's a little different. Uh, he doesn't immediately meet when he goes in the unconscious meet the um, both sides, the dark and the light side. He, uh, the anima entangles him in life and problems. And so now he must deal with inks, instincts and drives, not with the beyond, but with the imminent and the near. He must deal with those. And uh, so now the anima does not deal directly with uh, uh, the worldview and the religious problem, but indirectly in situations which force the man to revise his attitudes towards the religious problem. So the woman uh, directly confronts the, the dark and the light sides as soon as she enters the unconscious, but the, uh, because animus has to do with ideas and concepts, you know, where, where the man who confronts his anima is is now suddenly he's he's pulled in a lot. You know, the sirens, okay, you know, want to pull him into the unconscious, you know. Well, anyway, uh, that's sort of, uh, I don't think I, I polished it up. Maybe we can polish it up next time. That what's going to follow is the, uh, is the, uh, she's saying the danger of that you can't come out is illustrated by the fairy tale the woman who became a spider, which is an Eskimo fairy tale, uh, 
and uh, uh, that that's the the next one. I think we should go through them all, and then you know my next my next uh, suggestion is that we read from uh, volume thirteen of the Alchemical Studies, um, the Spirit Mercurius, and maybe a little bit about Hermes, and uh, because he is this uh, he he possesses both feminine and masculine aspects, you know. I mean, he's both. And uh, uh, then uh, also we could look at the philosophical tree too. They're not, neither one are that long. But anyway, uh, Gary, why don't we go around the room and just see if there's any uh, comments or uh, about, about this or about anything else? Yeah, I really enjoyed this. You know, I think there's something about dealing with fairy tales that just make them so much more tractable, you know? Um, because then it's so much, you know, stories, they make it so much easier to relate to our own lives and just what we see. Uh, Kat, would you like to make the first comment? There's so much sort of going around in my head. And like, I was thinking about stories and stories that seem to be fixed in our nature and things because one of the dreams I had was of a giant goddess that was like billions of years old and she wasn't you know I didn't have respect or paid attention to and the dream character in that dream for me um, was like a Dumbledore figure who said yeah she may be feel this kind of way and everything else and yes yeah, she's older than time and the land itself but even these states that supposedly are fixed need to change and um i had a dream last night um where i was stepping upon i don't know stromalites or something that like the oldest living fossils that we have so it's something to do with single cell and then it kind of mixed with the bacteria. And then we had complex cell, which was the start of all life. So I was stepping on these things, which are not actually meant to do in you know, ordinary life. And they, um, in the article, it called, it called them the, the stepping stones of life. But it was kind of like, taking that those basic sort of building blocks of nature and then having new life on them because these things that I saw last night in my dream were like a vivid green and to me they seemed like full of new life and you know freshness and everything else and it's there's just something around that really taking the very old I and mean, then that supposedly seems fixed even if it is 300 and sorry 3.5 billion years old and then changing it in some way having an alchemical process but I mean that was I'm thinking really well Kat now you know for our next first to the Sunday thing you have to paint these and then you know tell us a little more about them uh, no <laughs> <laughs> well well let me just tell you something uh, that you must be very intuitive or you're, at least your dreams are intuitive you know you know uh, what what the intuitive is very knowledgeable about uh, the nature of the gods okay now, the, the idea is you've had dreams where you, they tell you that the gods are saying, well, we're done with you. We're, we're gone. We're leaving. And then you meet another go god, goddess who's, uh, you know, billions of years old. I, I met her, too. She's in the, in, the, in, in, a, in the earth before there was any life on. And I ask her, what's on your mind right now? What is on your mind right now? The earth has no life on it. It's about to just explode and flow it. And then the other dream with, with all these um, wonderful relics of, you, you, you know, you look at these great big blocks of limestone. We live right next to them. 
that was an ocean with little crustaceans falling down to the bottom and then slowly just over hundreds of thousands of millions of years their the calcium in their shells it turned into limestone and it's hundreds of feet thick and we are living at the bottom of that ocean where well, this used to be the bottom of the ocean and we're living right next to all these for billions of years these things and you know one thing that uh, joseph campbell says i just think is so beautiful he says that um uh that photo receiving cells okay that is cells that can see uh, that can detect light did not come i think it was until either 600 or 300 million years in into that three and a half billion you know so so the first three billion of that was all in darkness you know just uh groping in darkness and then suddenly they said well wouldn't it be nice if we could uh you know uh see uh what's outside uh do have a new uh sense a way of sensation but anyway it's just uh you you the intuitive is the is the one who's expert on the inner world and and your dreams certainly are showing so would you uh, like to comment Yes, first of all, I have this question. Are we going to continue reading the fairy tales? Kurt, you're muted. You're mute. Oh, yes, we are. We're going to go through the whole book because we need to go through the whole book because each one builds on itself. Yeah. Yeah. So next time uh, we're continuing uh, how this made it or we're we going to read uh, the well, we to become a spider. Yeah, uh, we'll finish up the handless man. I just let maybe uh, let's just finish it up next time. Just because, um, you know, just dealing with it each week. Uh, it, let's just kind of sum it up uh, at the beginning and then we'll start with the. Uh, and also, I'm going to bring in a little bit of Robert Johnson. And if if I can get hold of Annette's friend and we'll present her uh, thing on the handless maiden. You know, uh, she does a whole program on the handless maiden. We'll bring that uh -huh. in. Yeah, I read it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I will try to get that uh, get in contact with her. But it, uh, but the next fairy tale we'll do is is the woman who became a spider. But I'm already scared. To... <laughs> okay, all right. Now I I'll tell you one thing too. I'm going to send out the text that's from the Kindle version because somebody really cleaned it up. If you compare the Kindle version with the one with the pages on it numbers. It's uh, it's got a lot of typographical errors that they cleaned up. So I'll send both texts out. Yeah, thank you. So what I was thinking when you were uh, speaking today, I was thinking about the mother and how the mother and the daughter they have the same um, characteristics. Uh, like the mother is completely um, disconnected with her instinct with her motherhood and she agrees uh, with the father to she helps him to cut her hands she definitely has no mother instinct towards her daughter and she's brutal and uh, just very disconnected and uh, the other thing that i was thinking when you were saying talking about um spontaneity um which is basically being in the moment if you're not in the moment you cannot it's not spontaneous and i was thinking about what trauma what trauma does to our psyche in ptsd we know that um we are not present because we are we have been traumatized we're either in the past or um, worried depressed about the past or worried about the future and we are always um being told uh, by spirituality, by Zen masters, that we have to be present in the moment. But I don't think it's a choice unless, uh, until you have resolved your issues, your, you have healed a part of your trauma. So actually being present and spontaneous is a sign of health. 
You know, we cannot make a decision to be in the moment. We have to resolve the issues from the past. Then we will, we will be present. And it's wonderful, like what you said about um, the women who lost the first half of their lives. What I really think about my life is just, I was sleepwalking. I was completely asleep. I was in underworld. And I look back and say, what was I thinking? You know, I wasn't present. I wasn't, I wasn't awake. I was asleep. It's really interesting. And this little, <laughs> little things that um, it says in the um, story, it's really fascinating. Like my part partner, who's, a, who's the king, what he does is before making art, he puts a piece of cloth on his eyes. And that's the way he meditates, just putting and covering his eyes. It's really amazing, just little things that, I don't know, fascinating. You know, what's, what's kind of interesting too is in a way, this is like the, the perfect psychological story because it begins with, you know, a family history that just completely traumatizes her, just, you know, like you were talking about, because when, you know, when she loses her hands, she loses her connection, and, and that's caused by the father. So, you know, the father is directly responsible for the trauma, and then for her being, you know, taken away. And I think so, the father is also silver-handed. I see a lot of silver handedness in um, the father, the actions. But, but it carried down through his generation. His being, uh, you know, that's an excellent observation. But, you know, his silver handedness resulted in his daughter's silver handedness as well. Well, the, the real, just, you know, horrible thing that happens is, is the devil tells it, either you cut off her hands or I take you. So he turns to her. Says, I guess we'll have to take off your hand. You know, I mean, he should have. It, what sh what should have been this answer then? Yeah, hey, talk about living through your, you know, your kids rather than letting them live their own yeah. lives. You know, <laughs> I I forget what Annette said about that. Uh, Annette, do you remember what you said about that uh, event? Because. Yeah, and go ahead and uh, you know make your comment next. Okay, yeah, but I, but it usually I, I find it very interesting when you talk about intergenerational because I think it's so accurate. The church and in many ways everybody, uh, whole societies are silver handed. Uh, handed, I think it's always really exciting actually. But um, what I said about it is that I thought in art you see a lot of people not drawing hands or they find it difficult or whatever. But they also don't express it because hands often are, are associated with how to do things like um, coming back to earth is giving people feet and hands, you know, and uh, if that is omitted, it's, it's, it's a clear sign of, of somebody floating, isn't it, or, or whatever they are on about is not very grounded, you know, and it's so common, like most of us have it. You know, it's, um, yeah, yeah, that's what I think. But um, yeah, th th that's, that's what struck me today, but also about the generational stuff. And, um, and that, yeah, that a lot of women, I think also, and also including myself, you kind of look back on the suffering, but you never see it as a time of incubation, <laughs> as, as a time of, um, you know, part of a process it was that it was actually very fruitful you know mm -hmm. and uh, this kind of waiting and it's it's still very hard to see introversion and not being productive as successful I think somehow yeah. I mean I can see it in my own eyes when I'm alone but when I talk to other people I still find that hard to to call all those 10 years that I I was kind of floating in my eyes or something or incubating to say that I was actually, that it was great, you know, that's what well, I have to make, you know. The, the pain 
I'm mean, just talking about myself. The pain of missing all that year, those years, is uh, I, I think is uh, is you, you know I just feel that pain about those years. So they weren't productive, other than that they, you, you know what what Bon Franz says that they eventually they force you into a depression. And she says, a depression is good because it, then it forces you to look inward for the first time. So really the first half of life, which should be, you know, youth is wasted on the young. The, the first half of life is really a, an exercise in uh, us finding out eventually that we're not the gods, we're not the masters here, and that we need to crash and burn. Now, yeah. until we can start the, the, the productive, really productive part of our life is through, re, through ego defeat, really. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, that's uh, what's so interesting about the, the um, uh, woman who does the chakra cello thing is each, each chakra is awakened by an ego defeat, grief, mm -hmm. uh, a loss, or something that she talks about each time. So I, I, I think the productive aspect of it is that, um, and, and I'm just brainstorming here. I don't know the answer, but it just seems that it, it has something to do with um, the productive life starts when we, when we hit bottom. We yes, have to hit I'm, bottom somewhere. Yeah, I think it is beautiful. It is my issue that I have to still see that as, as actually a very fruitful time. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just trying to figure out how uh, my, how that, you know, I guess the, the idea, if, it, if there were moments of great beauty in it, but uh, I don't know. It's a mystery. Yeah, I don't know, you know, for myself, you know, I look back on those times and think it's kind of without depth that, you know, when you don't, when you feel, you know, disconnected and just ego centered, you know, there just isn't, there just isn't much depth. Denise, would you like to uh, make a comment? Yes, thank you. Listen to all very carefully and very grateful for your comments. I was wondering about Hecate. Uh, one of the ladies of the underworld, and she stays there. She, I don't know if she comes back to surface. Koreb comes back, I know. Dionysus, Lord of the Souls, come back. But Ekate, Ekate stays, stays there. Uh, and so perhaps for some women, it's a choice to stay there. I don't know. I don't know. A healthy choice. Perhaps not an embodiment soul, but I don't know, a moon yeah. stuff. I don't know. That, that might come up in the next uh, fairy tale, the, uh, where she doesn't, the, the woman is, that who became a spider is, is like Hecate. Azim, you seem to know a lot about Hecate. Do you have any comments about that? I haven't read anywhere that she stays. I think she goes um, back and forth. But um, what I get from um, Hecate is that um, a part of us remains in the underworld. When you experience the underworld, there will always be a part of you that lives there. You never live totally. Like Persephone, she was going back and forth mm -hmm. because because once you once you know what is going going on there, um, you cannot delete that consciousness. You know, it's very powerful. It, it takes yeah. you over. It, it it has possession over you. Yeah, yeah. but um, Hecate is not possessed like Persephone. Um, yeah. she's um, she stands in between. Like, you know, in between death and life. So that's Persephone and Demeter, death and life. And Hecate is always in between, in this liminal space between mm. death and life. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. You know, yeah, Young says that 
Life is a short interlude between two great mysteries, which are in fact the same. <laughs> that, uh, that there's this, uh, and then while we're alive, I mean, the, the, the second half of life is a, a, is a dying. And, and, you know, the idea is this isn't, uh, it, I, I mean, I'm just, is the night sea journey, you know, that it, what what happened is when you see the sun uh, on the on the on the western sea and it goes down and it becomes night no one knew what happened to it and so that became a psychological image that ego consciousness goes below the surface and then it goes all the way around and then is reborn in the east you know when it comes up but what mystery happened what untold tale happens to that sun when it goes below the sea no one knew now we don't care what the sun does but there is a psychological uh power in that image that what happens to us when we go into a shamanic trance uh, there's this wonderful image of pythagoras coming out of the the cave you know after his uh, where you go down and you get chopped up in little pieces dismembered and then you get reassembled and reborn and then when you come out the other side uh now suddenly what what uh nude rasmussen said he says who who by the way had this help, is now you can instruct any member of the village because you uh went down you you you've experienced death one who has experienced death as a wisdom no one else has. Helene, would you uh, like to go next? Oh, uh, you're muted. Yeah, um, I used to be a union um, therapist, sanitary therapist, and uh, you go down under the sand and do things with figurines. And I thought so much of the uh, figurine I kept from those days that I identified with the most, which was my mother. And she's a lady with a cocktail glass in her hand and she's very elegant, you know, she's totally depressed and, um, you know, did not, did not relate very well as a mother. And uh, I just thought a lot about that. And so I've always been intrigued by the feminine and fairy tales, I suppose. And uh, even with my granddaughters, I try to expose them to um, Friedman's fairy tales. I don't know if anyone knows that. He has a wonderful explanation of what the fairy tale meant. And they're short and easy. They're speeches, actually, to grown-ups. But I try to get my granddaughters involved in these uh, tales. And they're easily to easy for me to digest, whereas... Friedman's a bit much, you know, it's a lot for me to, uh, I don't, I don't understand what all the mythology and symbolism is, even though I've studied the Greek mythology and the original Greek, but so what, you know, I was just a child then in college, I didn't know anything. And uh, it's only in the, I wanted to say this one thing about women, and I don't know if y'all have heard this, but it's like, um, the first half, the first third of my life belongs to my parents. The second third of my life belongs to my partner. The, the last, the third half of my life belongs to myself. And that's certainly been my experience. So that's all. Thank well, you for the thank you. discussion. Yeah, and as Zen put a request for the link to the uh, fairy tales, I'd like that too. That sounds just wonderful. The Friedman fairy tales? No, no, the simpler one. You said there was one that had explanations. That, Fried, you know, uh, yeah, Fried, Friedman's fairy tales. It, it comes with a discussion book. I think I've got it on the shelf here. Oh, know. okay. Maybe. I don't know. I just moved. I can't find anything. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, you know, hopefully you'll be back next time. You can always share it then, too. Yeah. 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 Put your email in the in the chat and we'll, uh, we'll send a... I mean, it's just because okay. I'll put up there. We do have a little bit of a secret Facebook group too. If you want to put stuff, I'll put a link to that too. And it's just well, I found of, you on oh, Facebook. Yeah, okay, I found great. you on Facebook. Okay, all right. Thank you. Oh, where are you from, by the way? I mean, 
Texas. Uh, and that's Texas. Uh, I thought uh, when he said y'all that. I know. <laughs> I heard myself say that. <laughs> yeah, well, well uh, Annette is from the UK. Uh, Zine is from Sacramento. Gary's, I think, from Omaha and from Iowa. I think Dahlia is from uh, Lithuania. Uh, Denise is, is from Peru. Kat is from the UK. Miles is from uh, 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 Alberta, Canada. Hmm. Welcome. Yeah. Great. Uh, Dahlia, do you have anything for us today? Um, yes, yes, hi. Um, I was thinking and I was relating also to the, um, to the, um, this idea of eyes, uh, like thinking, piercing eyes and um, like seeing with intuition. I know it spoke to me a lot today. And um, yeah, I have some associations concerning also, I work in visual field. I'm like very visual. I work in design and I, and I, I like it. And I also noticed like uh, one day, like I'm very perfectionist in some way, like really very like details, angles, shapes, colors, tones, and that almost sometimes it um, how to say it it limits even my my appreciation of things as well so i know i i can i can relate a lot to 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 this concept of how to see things how you can even perceive things and uh, yes from my from my personal experience i i I think like um, these thinking piercing eyes uh, can do harm when, uh, I don't know, I, I had, I noticed in a couple occasions how I, I, I see feminine, like femininity in a man. And I think that, um, I don't know, it's, I know it's my problem. <laughs> it's, I now I understand that it's like my my how to see, and it disturbs me. That's that's, and I was I, I'm trying to explore it more and like to understand. Like I know it's very stereotypical, and it's like I consider myself like quite liberal person. <laughs> so like to 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 notice myself like. Sometimes there are things I, yeah, I see uh, not the way I thought I will. So, so yeah, I think it rings a bell for me with uh, the, this, this part of the, the. Yeah, fascinating. You know, so when you say I see sometimes with piercing eyes, you know, to me that says that, you know, maybe you look at it too analytically and, and you just, you know, you just take it apart rather than than you know going for you know like going too much for the details rather than the force and the feeling involved it is and then is, is that kind of what you were saying yeah i think i i, I didn't solve the whole uh, riddle for myself but i i i start understanding how i see things and it's like uh, yeah, thanks to this feedback also of other people, maybe. Yeah, well, you know, but I think that's 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 such a good observation, too. I mean, you know, I think it's our, you know, growing awareness of ourselves that helps us to make progress. When, when yeah. artists who, who worked with Frida Kahlo, you know, it, you know, she was his teacher. She said, he told her, he, he, he said, she says, don't you see the this purple halo? around all the green plants. She says, mm -hmm. there's a purple halo. And he he didn't see it, but she taught him to see the purple halo that surrounds all green plants. I mean, oh, when beautiful. he was painting, there needed to be a purple halo around the plants. And he didn't right. see it until she pointed it out. I love it. Charles, do you uh, have any comments today? 
Um, I had a couple things. Um, one was related to this. Um, and I feel like this has probably been explained before, but a, so I just wanted to clarify, you know, when we're talking about a negative mother complex or a negative father complex, is that a complex that affects us in a negative way? Or is that a complex that was informed by negative experiences? Because uh, I would say that I have a negative mother complex, but like that it was um, not that my, you know, mother like harmed me or did anything like overtly negative towards me, just that my complex affects me overall in a negative way. And um, like, I, I, I don't know, I, I don't, I'm just curious about the distinction between a negative or a positive mother or father complex? Well, I'm not an expert at it, but she, Von Franz mentions that the women who had a pos positive mother complex, you know, and, and had a family and had, you know, many, many kids and, and this, this very vibrant family life that, that, the, and, she says the one with the negative complex may have missed all that, but she learned something through suffering that that person would never know. Now, is that a good exchange? I don't know. But, you know, you know the negative mother complex in the Puer Eternus is basically, he, he uh, can be two things. Well, one is the devouring mother. You know, well, it's, it's pretty much is, is that uh, the mother that eats us back you know that there's the there's the negative mother devouring mother and the complex means just a cluster of associations that keep you out of life keep you from you either passive and or, or something you know i mean you don't in, in the case of the poor eternus they they live in a realm of bliss because they never leave the womb but um does anybody have any comments about the the negative mother complex now and he asked is that from uh, experiences or is it just you? i i'm in i'm in his boat my mother was oh. not negative so but can, i i had a negative mother complex i'm certainly not an expert but I, uh, the comment that i'll make is that the negative mother complex it's really one of two things it's either it's you know the devouring mother she won't let go you know she wants to keep you you know and have you support her needs or the other one is that she fails to nurture you you know i think both of those would fall into that role if we have if we have an expert you can chime in and say no <laughs> i'm still suffering from it yeah go ahead um one of the differences between jung and freud was that jung believed that complex um, complexes can be rooted in collective. So we have collective complexes and personal unconscious uh, complexes. So in Freudian um, um, psychology, the emphasis is on personal unconscious and we use it as the personal mother experience. But Jung believed that um, the healing comes from um, going from mother complex in the personal level to mother complex in collective or mother archetype. So that was his approach. That's why he wasn't really digging into childhood stuff. Yes, yes, that's true. That's true, Azim. Yeah. And what I also think in the end, it's the individual itself that um says am i suffering from it or not and it might still be unconscious but who knows we all have our un unconscious issues yeah. uh it's 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 the let you decide yourself whether you suffer from it or not and i think charles you are saying that you are not suffering from it is that right 
I, I think um, he's suffering no, from that, it. Yeah, no. I'm suffering from it. <laughs> <laughs> it, it. It separated me from having a, a good relationship with, uh, with um, uh, a, 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 a satisfying relationship with women in my early years. And I think to some extent, you're having that same issue, don't, aren't you, Charles? Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, I don't really have relationships much with anyone yeah. at all. I, in my case, it was like delusions of grandeur, or I put the woman on a pedestal. I didn't see her as a real being, but I, my anima projection on her was just too, too uh, overwhelming for me. You know, and this poor girl I was with was saying, what in the hell is wrong with you? You know? Oh, and yeah, by the way, that's, that's perfect. Because what it really boils down to is an inability to relate to what's in front of us. Yes. So go ahead. Yeah, don't forget Miles. I mean, we're, yeah, Miles, Miles, Miles yeah. You, you have an it. unlimited what's, amount of, to talk, Miles. Yeah, ahead. right. You can tell us about what's going on in the indigenous world. <laughs> Oh, wow. Um, this has just been so resonant with me and synchronistic. Um, so you're I'm really being turned into a tree hugger and a cow hugger. Um, <laughs> really changing me in profound ways. And, and I'm reminded of Jung's definition of God, that God is everything that crosses our paths, good or bad, for better or worse. And so related to that is, you know, very powerful to learn that depression is necessary because you have to go down and, and that'll force you into introspection and trying to make sense of the world. Um, and this conversation about forests is so resonant because um, just this week on Wednesday, I was talking to a prominent nuclear physicist scientist here in Canada on Zoom and related to you know, our climate issues. And the question I posed to him was, you know, that this focus on carbon dioxide is actually the wrong problem definition. And I'm just relaying work of a prominent scientist who I know who is trying to wake people up to the fact that we shouldn't be talking about carbon dioxide. We should be talking about trees. And trees is what we are talking about. And I don't know, Craig, if you've got those pictures that I emailed you, did you see my message? And I wonder if you could share those. Um, and it'd be interesting to especially Annette, who's in Ireland. And one of the things, what I said to the scientist, these pictures are from this location called Glendalough, if I'm saying it cor correctly, yeah, in Wicklow, Ireland. I was there with my family in 2018. Yes. Yeah. And one of the things that I, and if Craig can bring up some actual photos that we took when we were in this location, one of the things that really staggered me was to learn that Ireland not too long ago was covered in old growth forests. And curiously enough, the very first place we visited when we landed and we had to wait for our hotel because we got there in the morning and the hotel, you couldn't check in until noon. So that's Glendalow. Um, uh, what I learned was that Ireland once was nothing but old growth thick forests. And near the airport, as I was saying, we had to wait for our hotel, there was a park and there were some massive trees in this park, like huge fat trunks on them. And um, and so why is why am I 
mentioning this in connection with this nuclear scientist. Well, I said to I told him, I said the issue we shouldn't be talking about worrying about carbon dioxide. We should be worried about trees and biodiversity because uh, yeah. the real the problem with our climate is because 12,000 years ago, and this is a study in nature, there were six trillion trees on the planet. We're now down to half that many at three trillion trees, and we're continuing to lose trees. Now, why are we losing trees? Well, again, if we are not looking at the correct issue, if you're concern is, oh, we've got to stop fossil fuel use, but you're not looking at the fact that these trees have been cut down, um, you're not going to solve the problem. Now, why are trees being cut down? Well, it's because, uh, and you know, I'm not here to convince anybody how to live your life, but the same scientist that is talking about the fact that we need to look at trees rather than fossil fuels uh, is what this book is based on. His friend wrote this book and food is climate. And strangely enough, you showed the cow being freed. The reason why we've lost so many trees is because of our diet. And if we don't change our diet, I'm not saying you can't have your occasional burger, steak, pork chop, and chicken, but um, our biodiversity and forests have crashed because of this diet of ours. Um, and so that's resonant with, or that resonates with me synchronistically. And I'm seeing, you know, that yes, we are to be water carriers in this age of Aquarius. So why do we need to carry water? Well, would it be perhaps because we need to regenerate these forests? And um, literally, uh, the, you know, I'm thinking that the person, the man who says, take the child out is an encouraging masculine energy, a positive animus. And I kid you not, the scientist, Dr. Rao, who is the one promoting that we're not looking at the problem correctly, Dr. Silas Rao, he actually uses a, an analogy of a baby in a bathtub full of CO2 and carbon dioxide. And we are being called upon to literally save the baby in this bathtub, you know, pull the baby out. Uh, and so that's what, you know, it's just very strange that um, we're talking about this handmaiden's tale, and it just totally relates to what I've been incubating and brooding with, you know, and it's like, okay, what am I supposed to do with this? Well, I guess part of it is sharing this with you and see what you think. So maybe I'll be quiet and let you guys talk. My father planted 3,000 trees on his plant. I, I planted a couple hundred, but anyway. Well, anyway, we're next time we're gonna uh, maybe finish the Handless Maiden and we'll also start on the, uh, we can, on the uh, one which I think is Denise uh, will help us with uh, understand Hecate a little better is someone who, who stays in that uh, realm. And what does that mean? You know, but, but great to see you, Aline and uh, Denise and Annette and, uh, and uh, Miles and uh, Kat and Dahlia and Charles and Azine. And uh, we'll uh, st do it uh, same time next time. So we'll see you all later. Yeah. Okay, bye guys. Thank you. Thank uh, you so Sunday. much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Okay, bye, guys. Bye-bye. Hi, thank you.